Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to another episode of the Legal Beagle Podcast. Today, we're talking with Tate. Tate is back, ladies and gentlemen. He is going to share with us res judicata that he's been battling in state court with his matching federal court. And he's thinking outside the box, just like our last guest, uh, John Gentry. Um, thinking about uh, ways to come at these these people and 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 with with different different thoughts, different ideas, and throwing the kitchen sink at them, as we said in the in the episode. And so we've had a we had a couple little minor glitches in the beginning because of my internet, because I'm visiting the parents, as you can see behind me. Before y'all start complaining in the comments, you know I know about it and it's it's minor. But anyway, uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed this episode. I did, and it's certainly some things to uh, consider moving forward, uh, bringing state claims as well as federal claims, and, and kind of a, a claim splitting. And we go over all that in the in the in this episode. And uh, I encourage you to watch uh, a good portion of this at least uh, to to learn and and think about uh, implementing this in some some of your own actions. So without further ado. Here's Tate. Welcome, Tate. Welcome back. Thank you for being here. What's on your mind? Yeah, thanks for having me back, Gary. Of uh, course. Essentially, this is about the grass case, the, the city of Oxford property maintenance code in which they entered my property multiple times and cut the grass. Mm. So that had been, I believe, March 4th was the final motion it was fully briefed uh defense had filed their 12v6 i had filed you know the reply to it i actually ended up filing uh i think a sir reply to it anyway everything's been fully briefed since march 4th so all of a sudden early may i got a notification in that case that a motion had been filed to essentially sub supplement the 12b6 motion with the defense of res judicata okay so the res judicata is it's claim preclusion so uh, what had happened was this was stemming from a case that i brought in the and and claim preclusion because you they say you brought uh, the similar case right is that basically what yes. res judicata is yeah, so res judicata, it's Latin for a matter adjudicated. So it's it's very similar, and it's kind of where the basis in double jeopardy. So a matter adjudicated cannot be re-adjudicated by the same parties. Uh, every state has their own laws when it comes to the specifics of res judicata. Many of them are similar. Some of them are much more... Uh, some of them are more lenient, some of them are not at all. Ohio's would be something that is not considered lenient, let's say. But so what had happened is, I believe in October, I filed a very novel, novel lawsuit uh, in the Butler County Common Police Court of Ohio for, it was the same defendants, it was the same fact set, however, this case revolved around all of my claims revolved around violations of my Ohio constitutional rights. So, you know, it's the mirrored right, the Fourth Amendment right is mirrored in Article 1, Section 7, I believe. So it was all monetary damage claims based around violations of my Ohio constitutional right. So I did this for various reasons. Uh, I kind of got inspired after reading a book uh, by Chief Judge of the Sixth Circuit. His name is Anthony Sutton, uh, or Jeffrey Sutton, I believe, just Jeffrey Sutton. So he wrote a book called 51 Imperfect Solutions, in which it, it's a, I would recommend this book to everyone to read it. It, it gives great detail in our federalist system, uh, particularly about state versus federal law and how what we have now is such a top-down approach. Everyone wants to just go to federal court, file 1983 actions, and our state constitutions and our state laws are kind of getting left in the wayside in this. And this book really painted a very good picture 
about four instances in which the states shaped the federal rights. The states shaped what the Supreme bring. You know, the Ohio Constitution is a wonderful document. Uh, I think we, a lot of us, there's more freedoms in those constitutions versus, you know, our wonderful United States Constitution. So there was a, there, another law article that I read from, I think it was from 1995, and essentially it was about, oh, it was called Opening the Courthouse Doors, Permitting uh, Causes of Action Stemming from Violations of the Ohio Constitution. So <laughs> this hasn't been done, it hasn't been successfully done since 1842. But in 1842, there was a case called Jeffries v. Ankeny in Ohio, in which a half Indian, half white man was was refused his right to vote in an election because at the time you had to be you couldn't be Indian, you know you couldn't you, only whites could vote. So he correctly he tried to I'm half white I I'm allowed to vote by law. They disallowed that they basically determined he was full Indian. He brought suit in the courts. It worked all the way up to the Ohio Supreme Court. Uh, his claim was that uh, you know, he was damaged by not having his right to vote. The Ohio Const it wasn't even a question whether or not he could bring the action. It wasn't even a question whether or not he could, you know, had a claim of valid, valid cause of action. It went to the Ohio Supreme Court. He won monetary damages. I think he won like 17 cents. Uh, which, you know, <laughs> I guess that went a long way then, but so he won. So there is precedent here, you know, 180 year old precedent, but there is precedent where, where, where you, where there have been monetary damages awarded for violations of the Ohio constitution. So I brought that action in Butler County common police court with the intent, with the knowledge that it was going to be, there's no way that they would. Uh, there have been other cases in these last 180 years, particularly in the last 30 or so, in which it's been stated that there is no cause, there is no claim for damages stemming from violations of your Ohio constitutional rights. These other actions, both of which, the two main ones, were public employees. They were employees of the government of Ohio. And so they had the court, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled that they had administrative remedy, but that they did reserve the right that the Ohio Supreme Court could, uh, if they wanted to, basically create this new remedy. Okay, so so you you've got this the same issue in federal court too, right? Well, or, are you or, about or the grass cutting thing, issues? right? The, the grass cutting. Well, what, what what do you mean? So so uh, aren't you in federal court and oh yeah with this I issue was, as well? Yes, I was. Okay. So I filed this in October, having already previously filed the federal court. So it was exactly the same thing. Okay. And it was four months later. I think I filed the federal action in May. This one was filed in October. But once again, this one was strictly. I didn't even mention anything about the federal court. I didn't mention anything about federal rights or federal causes of action or anything of that nature. It was strictly Ohio constitutional rights. So. I, I, cause so I, that that's your distinction. You're you're claiming constitutional rights in the federal court, and you're claiming Ohio constitutional rights in the the common police court, right? Yeah. So it's Ohio constitutional rights strictly in the common police court, and then the federal court. I had federal rights. I had my I had state torts as well. Uh, that's where I had my state torts, and then I had you know our impanelment of a federal grand jury. I had nineteen eighty five three in that, in the federal court. So, and so you found I, completely new causes of action to go into state court. Yes. Only, uh, only my, and only pertaining to my Ohio constitutional rights, which, Hey, the Ohio constitution, our state constitution is just as valid. Uh, there's, they're dual sovereigns. That's, our, that's our federalist system. You mm -hmm. know? So, and this is what the book 51 imperfect solutions really drove home is that it, it stated, over and over, what lawyers are doing is essentially they're like a basketball game. No, no basketball player. If you get fouled on a shot, you get two free throws. Any basketball player that just elects to shoot one free throw, it, it doesn't make sense. But that's what lawyers are doing now: is they have 
you get fouled. So you have a fourth amendment. You get, you know, you have, if you have a, if you have a cause of action under the fourth and the fifth amendment, then you also have a cause of action under the, those same provisions in your state constitution. And they're not, they are, they're, they're not, they're mutually exclusive. They, they, they operate equally on their own behalf. And there's nothing that says that just because a federal court determines X, Y, Z, that you don't, that there's nothing that says that the state court has to do the same thing. And, so, and did you not, did you not realize this when you filed federal, I, I think you can bring state, state claims into federal court, or is this just another way to, to really put a triangle on them? To be frank with you, I, had I to do it over again, I probably wouldn't have done it because okay. like I, this, what it created for me, the possibility of having preclusion, like, like I said, my heart was it just, oh, it sank when I, when I read their motion, but their motion came, it was just strange. It came two months after, it came two months after the pleadings had been closed in the federal court. And it came four months after the dismissal in state court. And like four months after the 30 days were up for me to file an appeal. So it just took them forever to do this. But ultimately I thought I screwed up so badly. I didn't even have it in my mind about res judicata when I filed the Butler County Common Pleas action. So, but I still don't think that it, and ultimately as we get into this discussion, why would the Sixth Circuit chief judge write a book in which he talks about two separate free throws if res judicata claim, if I was good, if it was just so easy to be claim precluded? He didn't, res judicata <clears throat> or claim preclusion collateral estoppel that wasn't mentioned once in this book so you would think you know that he if it were such right if it were such a clear-cut issue why would the chief sixth circuit chief judge write a book where i was inspired by it some idiot pro se to go off and do something under my ohio constitution and then i'm precluded so it just <clears throat> i reread the book after you know, and, and after this whole thing went down and I put several excerpts in the book in my reply uh, brief. So that's that's what's that's essentially what created the claim preclusion of res judicata was that the dismissal of the first action, as it's called, that precludes the second action. Interestingly, even though it's temporarily, you know, even though the state action was filed four months after the federal court, since it came, since it was, since it was, uh, was, was the first to come to a conclusion, that becomes then the first action when it comes to res judicata, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the fact you're, uh, you're digging deep in. <laughs> into some 100 uh, year old oh. stuff that and i'm sure they <laughs> yeah. hate it <laughs> they hate it oh well the, ju the the judge bless his heart uh the, you know <laughs> butler county common please judge like he issued a, an 11 page it didn't go into the merits whatsoever which is something that we'll discuss here it just basically said we there's nothing before the court like there's there, there's that's essentially what he said there's nothing i didn't and that's the thing I didn't, there wasn't, there were no claims before the court. There's no law on the books in Ohio, like 42, 1983, where there's a federal statute, a federal act that created this cause of action. There's nothing like that in Ohio, but what's a right without a remedy? You know, it's just empty words. If, if, if I have the right to peaceable assemble through my Ohio constitution, but there's no remedy provision, what the hell? Like then, it, then it's meaningless. And that's kind of what I was spurred on by with all this. What that? Why is my Ohio constitutional right uh, a redheaded stepchild here to where it just is meaningless and it just didn't sit well with me? So I decided to say screw it, and I did it. Uh, ultimately, it, it, it's, I don't. I'm 99.9% .9 sure that res judicata is not going to apply. Apply, but for a while there, I was really heartsick over being so stupid that I screwed up my, you know, slam dunk grass case with some novel idea. But <laughs> here we are. Yeah. So, I, I like, I like bless his heart. Bless his heart. Yeah. I mean, this more, this, I mean, he's better than my 
Magistrate Likovitz, my federal magistrate, my goodness, she doesn't even have, she shouldn't even be in an administrative kangaroo court. She's got no business have, but that's neither here nor there. But yeah, right. this guy, this guy, you know, it's just, it's above his, yeah. So he didn't even rule it. So that's one of the, so if I may, we'll get into uh, that first document here, the res judicata document. As I stated, res judicata and the issue of claim preclusion is state dependent. So let's say if you go into the Sixth Circuit or the, the, the you know, whatever appellate circuit, whatever state you're in, that is the law that the appellate circuit will use. So obviously for the federal district court in Ohio, they use the Ohio claim preclusion laws. So I'm just going to read this here. Uh, is this the highlighted um, section you're on? Yes, on okay. page two. Oh. So under Ohio law, the doctrine of res judicata includes the concept of claim preclusion, which prohibits the litigation of claims that could have been brought in a previous action. So could have been brought. So if you think about this, you go to federal court, you file a 42-1983 for your Fourth Amendment, and you file, let's say, uh, 42 1985 3 for conspiracy and you leave out anything else let's say that people like you came onto your property and trespassed and the government committed negligence but you didn't include those state torts if you file you know within the time frame within the statute of limitations let's say you go you split this would be considered claim splitting <coughs> if you take if you go to state court, if you go to the Butler County Common Pleas and you have trespass and you have negligence, so you've split your claims. So let's just, what would happen is, is if your federal action were dismissed, you would be then precluded because uh, you could have brought, you could have brought those state claims into the federal court. Mm -hmm. And that's what the argument was by the defense by the defense counsel for me is that I could have brought my my 1983 action into the state court and I obviously could have brought all my state court claim state tort claims into the state action right. so therefore I could have done all that which pro and I lost the state you know the Ohio constitutional which I could have brought all those things according to him even though I argue that I couldn't that's a separate argument here but so the Sixth Circuit has interpreted Ohio's doctrine of claim preclusion as having four elements. Most of your states will have four, three or four elements here. Number one, a prior final valid decision on the merits by a court of competent jurisdiction. A second, number two, a second action involving the same parties or their privies as the first. And number three, a second action raising claims that were or could have been litigated in the first action and the final element number four a second action arising out of the transaction or occurrence that was the subject matter of the previous action so if you think about my case people trespassing fourth amendment fifth amendment cutting my grass blah 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 it was the so that number two a second action involving the same parties or their privies as the first all of the defendants were the same. It was the city of Oxford. It was all the same defendants. So that check mark that. Uh, a second at number four, a second action arising out of the transaction or occurrence that was the subject matter of the previous action. Absolutely. All the facts set were the exact same. They came onto my property without warrant or permission. They chopped down my, you know, cut my grass, chopped down the trees, all the, 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 the excessive fine. So that covers it. So where it gets interesting is number one for instance a prior final valid decision on the merits by a court of competent jurisdiction so what on the merits is is typically a 12b6 motion to dismiss would be considered on the merits mm -hmm. so where i argued here and where, where I, what i came to find out is that there were no claims before the, there were i brought no claims before the ohio court i just made it up i mean i'm not trying like I, it's not frivolous i just there was no there was no claim there was nothing by law that this judge could rule on 
So although he, although the motion to dismiss by the defendants was a 12B6, it was under that. It was just the guise of a 12B6. It was actually a 12B1. The court never had subject matter jurisdiction. This is at least my argument, uh, and we'll see what the judge says about this. And, this is and, one of and my... your your federal court case is ongoing, right? Still. Oh, absolutely. Okay. They filed this. That th this was the res judicata defense was filed into the federal court, stemming from the Ohio constitutional stuff that expired in January. So yeah, this is all, this is my federal, my judge is going to be ruling on all of this along with, he's got literally like three motions along with my motion for sanctions, uh, a rule 201 motion, the, the original motion to dismiss the case. And now this addition to that motion to dismiss, which we'll get into in terms of how this should trigger a, a rule 56 motion for summary judgment. But so I'm making the argument, one of my defenses here of how res judicata shouldn't apply is that the Ohio Butler County Common Pleas Court never had subject matter jurisdiction. So although, and he never ruled on anything on the merits, he basically just said, I can't rule on it. Like there's no claims before me. There's, there's no law upon which I can rule on dismissed. He did give some ancillary, like two paragraph thing with it's well settled that, you know, ordinances, but he said zoning ordinances. This wasn't a zoning ordinance. He said, it's well settled that blah, blah, blah. So like, that's not on the merits. I'm sorry. Like that, that's not at all on the merits. There was nothing. My argument is that there was nothing before that court upon which that judge could rule on. So although it was a 12 B six dismissal, that's only on surface. It was truly, there was no subject matter. The, the, the court did not have sub, no court in Ohio would have subject matter jurisdiction. That's why I didn't bring it to federal court because I knew there's no way in hell that a federal judge would have the authority or would, would rule on something so novel. Like it was appropriate to take it to the Ohio Supreme Court, which was my original intent. I decided not to do that. I decided not to appeal it. I, I just had too many things going on, but that was my original intent because I knew there was no way that any other court could properly adjudicate this. Gotcha. So that's number one. I'm, my argument is that so out, out of those elements, I do not believe that the court had competent jurisdiction. Uh, and 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 just to be concise, what what is what are your what's your argument why it's not it, it's not res judicata? What what's what's the element that you're saying that doesn't fit? Well, I'm saying number one doesn't fit a prior. There was no prior final valid decision on the merits by a court of competent jurisdiction. I argue that what I brought before that Ohio, that Ohio court, it was not on the merits. There was no, there was no competent jurisdiction. Am I, that's one of my arguments, that there was no jurisdiction, that that court did not have jurisdiction to hear the claims. The only court that it could hear and create these claims, because it would literally need to be created would be the Ohio Supreme Court. So I, I would have to have appealed it all the way. So that, that court, although I, there's nothing, like claim one was violation of Ohio Constitution, and I asked for mo monetary damages. Because people have come before the courts for decades now asking, you know, saying that you violated my Ohio constitutional right, but there's nothing, like there's no claim. There's no valid claim. That's how the courts have been in Ohio. That's how the federal courts in Federal courts in Ohio, and that's how the Sixth Circuit has been ruling, is that there is no cause of action for such a claim. So there li literally is no claim. Uh, that's not, I mean, I think that's a pretty strong argument. It's not my strongest, mm -hmm. uh, but it's one of them. So let's see here. What's the other number three? Claims that were could have been litigated. Okay, so another one. I'm arguing also that number three doesn't apply. And I, this was, these. this probably isn't, these aren't the best arguments, but I, there's no way that a state court would have any jurisdiction over my request for a federal grand jury to be impaneled. So that's one of the things that I found, because I've been kind of waffling a little bit on our, our inclusion of, you know, crimes, because oftentimes a lot of guys have been, I, don't, I think, doing it incorrectly, where they're putting a claim I, as 18 USC 241 242 that's not a valid claim uh, mm -hmm. and those get dismissed all the time but you can't bring criminal claims into a court but the federal the request to impanel a grand jury you know in accordance with whatever the statute is in 18 USC 4 to presenting a magistrate or a judge with you know uh, 
federal felonies, that's a different animal. And there's no way that I could have brought that claim into a state court. That's one of my arguments. Uh, so <laughs> that was, so he, so here's where we are. I followed him. I followed a motion to, I filed a reply brief. I kept studying and cause they had four months, the way I figure it, they had four months to do this. You know, I, I, this is a pretty like deep dive. It's not the easiest thing to learn, especially as a pro se. So I'm, and I, I don't have, I don't hold any, like, I don't mind using my pro se status f for me. Like I'm just a dummy. I'm just a dumb per se. <laughs> I have special rules that apply to me. And so I have more leniency. Jared Wagner, Mike, the opposition counsel conferred with him. He said he wouldn't, he wouldn't unoppose it but he said what i could do he was nice he, he was actually he said what i could do is just file he said i'm not giving you advice but you might just want to file a motion you know for a for a, a request for a leave for filing the sir reply and then he would oppose that motion and then we so that's what i did so i filed a leave for sir reply and if you pull that one up uh let's see here that one just I got more nuanced with the argument. You know, I, I read the restatement of judgments. So that's something that we should all, and I don't know whether or not I should say we should all know about this because I don't know how I feel about advising or I do believe that we do have two separate shots, two separate free throws. And I do think that there's a, I think that we should be filing mirrored claims to some degree in the state courts for our state constitutional violations uh, especially but, with the uh with the with the with the technicalities all these judges rule on you know that why why not why not absolutely and here's the thing is we're getting we're all getting just shafted left and right here they're throwing the kitchen sink at us let's throw the kitchen sink at them and right. and, and i and i don't really I don't really think that there's, we have no better chance. The only thing, the only argument where I would say that we're all seeking those adults in the room and they're not, that, that, that we're having a difficult time finding them in federal court. We're, we're sure as hell not finding them in the kangaroo courts. We can all know that. But who's to say that there's not state judges that are going to be that adult uh, or the state Supreme Courts? And then that's another thing is it's much easier to get to your state Supreme Court than it is the federal Supreme Court. That's absolutely true. Uh, the only thing that I can kind of see is that the, the appellate circuits, those are adults. Those, the federal appellate courts are adults. And we'll see with my, with my uh, appeal, as well as Alphonse, as we'll be seeing here shortly, if they're worth their salt. But my thing is we're all in the search for an adult. File these things in state court, perhaps, and let's put them to the test. Let's, let's make it difficult and let's bring it to the Florida Supreme Court or the Ohio Supreme Court or the Louisiana Supreme Court for our state constitutional rights, which are just as valid under our federalist system. Mm -hmm. So, and especially once again, if you read that book, 51 Imperfect Solutions, I, I'm, I, I very much believe that we all should read that book. It's just good reading in general. Uh, and it can help us get a good grasp, grasp on how a chief judge of a federal court views these things. So uh, every, so let, let's actually pull up the restatement of okay. judgment section 24. Okay. We're there. 26 exceptions. Uh, let's go with 24, section 24. 24. So, okay. So, so this is. I kept reading more and more cases as I was, so I filed my reply. Then I wanted to, I, I was wanted to file my sir reply. Uh, and I just kept studying and studying and studying and finding more and more things. And Ohio courts use what is called the restatement. And I kept seeing the restatement, the restatement, the restatement of judgment. So thankfully Jill has Westlaw. She was able to get this for me. So this is, this is Ohio law follows the restatement. Like, period. Uh, so this is the restatement and, and many state courts, many states follow the restatement. Um, this is what this is. The restatement of judgments in section 24 de it deals with, you know, claim splitting, res judicata and preclusion. So I'm just going to read a couple things here. 
so this is like the section 24 of the restatement is the general concept and the general ideas around res judicata and claim preclusion. So it defines what a claim is. So in the context of res judicata, a claim uh, has never been broader than the transaction to which it related. So a claim is, let's see here, the present trend is to see claim in factual terms and to make it cont coterminous, I don't know what that word means, with the transaction regardless of the number of substantive theories or variant forms of relief flowing from those theories. So you can't just take, oh, I, I have one theory that I'm going to take it to this court. I have another theory and I'm going to take it into this court. You can't do that. Uh, that would be considered claim preclusion and that would be claim splitting. So, and if you lose with one relief, like you try one thing, you can't go back and try another thing. That That's classic res judicata. That's classic, you know, double jeopardy to a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so regardless of the number of primary rights that may have been invaded and regardless of the variations in the evidence needed to support the theories or rights, the transaction is the basis of the litigative unit or entity which may not be split. So when we, so Jill actually, Jill was the one that kind of, she knew about claim splitting. I didn't really know what it was. And she made a great point that what, what they were arguing is that I should have basically split the claims. Like they were, they were arguing that in order to avoid claim preclusion and claim splitting that I had split my claims, which is, you know, doesn't make didn't make it doesn't make any sense at all so my arguments were initially that I could not have brought certain actions to the state court and I also was arguing that the state court never had subject matter jurisdiction over any of the claims but when it comes to claim splitting let me think about this for a second okay so let's go to Section 25 is just more examples. Uh, we don't really need to get into section 25, but section 26 is the big one here. Section 26 of the restatement. Okay. These, are the, these are the exceptions to the general rule for preclusion or splitting. So number one, Bart, like this is open and shut, game over, is A, consent to or acquiescence in splitting. So basically, this is what happened. They never, the, the defense counsel never objected to the splitting of the claims. They never said anything in the state court. They met the, in the state court in his motion to dismiss, he mentioned that there was a, a federal case going on, just mentioned it, but that's it. He didn't object to it. He didn't file a mo Like oftentimes, what lawyers will do is in the federal, he, what he should have done is filed a motion to stay in the federal case. He didn't say boo in the federal case. Is this the same lawyer you're dealing with? Same lawyer, yes. So this is the same lawyer from the Grass case. He's the same lawyer in the Mass Gathering case. So he's the same lawyer in all these things. So I'm quite familiar with him. Uh, he's actually a good dude. There's nothing, not I, nothing I love more than being technically right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't say boo. He didn't say anything in the federal case at all about the Ohio case. He didn't object to it. He didn't say this is this. That's what he, he should have jumped up and down and said, we, we got to stay here because so he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything in either court. So listen to this where the plaintiff is simultaneously maintaining separate actions based upon parts of the same claim and in neither action does the defendant make the objection that another action is pending based on the same claim judgment in one of the actions does not preclude the plaintiff from proceeding in obtaining judgment in the other action the failure of the defendant to object to the splitting of the plaintiff's claim is effective as an acquiescence in the splitting of the claim so he acquiesced he acquiesced to the claim splitting and he he knows he's like he made he argued in his reply brief to my leave for to file the surreply. He said that 
Claim splitting is only only applicable when it's within the same court, like within the same federal court or within the same court system, like within like they have to both be the federal. My judge has a case that this guy had cited. My judge has a federal case in which the issue of claim splitting came up and it was a state court action was the other. I have a dozen. I put a dozen because I just went on you know, Google Scholar, and I could, I found three cases from the Sixth Circuit in cases, I could, I could have found hundreds. It's just, it's wrong. There, I have a myriad of examples of claim splitting, the, the acquiescence to claim splitting, being one case in state court, one, one, one claim, or one case in federal court. So he's just wrong about that, like hilariously slow, and lying, like it's just, and he's dry, grasping at straws. But so, that's the big one. Uh, and if you like, if you like scroll down, you can see where I've highlighted other ones, uh, other exemptions to, or exceptions to the general rule of claim splitting. Mm -hmm. So there are so many here and I think they're all good. The nice thing about this is that there is discretionary power that the judge has. The judge has a decent amount of discretion when it comes to ruling on these things and there's never been a case like this there's never been a case i can't there's I, literally it's been eight since 1842 that anything you know has so there's never been a case presented in which someone is arguing strictly state constitutional rights and then they have a federal case to boot it just there are like i said comedy which is the you know, comedy is something which is like a federal federalism type deal where the state and the state and the United States work in unison with each other. That's called comedy. And so that's there's a balance between, that's why we have a federal system. There's a balance between state power and federal power. And the state courts have autonomy. So if the state courts have autonomy to some degree, you know, they can't go against Supreme Court rulings to some degree. I don't know. That's where it's like, I read that book. And if the state, if the United States Supreme Court says, you can't do this for your Fourth Amendment, right? There's nothing that says that the Ohio Supreme Court for, let's say, an uh, unlawful search and seizure, that they can't say that they disagree with the Ohio, the United States Supreme Court. So regarding... And, and like, this is off topic, but is it, is it a little bit cheaper to in state court for you guys? Uh, much or, cheaper. Yeah, like what, what, cheaper? what's a filing fee and... Gosh, you, I'm on, you I want to say it was like a hundred bucks. I, I don't, wow. I don't quite, rem, I don't quite remember. It wasn't ne like what I think it was three hundred. It was very expensive and much. It's, it's considerably less expensive. It's faster. You have, you have a much faster like and your appeals process is. The whole thing is. Faster. You can set hearings. You can set hearings yes. for your motions. Yes, yes, and you mm. have. I a lot of states have like basically. I I could. I don't know the. Every state probably has different rules when it comes to going in front of the Supreme Court, but I could have ultimately, the Supreme Court would have, of Ohio would have had a very difficult time saying no to my, like, I think they almost had to, if I remember the rules. I don't quite recall, but it's just a far faster process. It's a far less expensive process. It's a more familiar process. Uh, <clears throat> you should have a common police court close to you, whereas there, the, there's no guarantee. Like, thankfully, my federal court is in Cincinnati, which is only 40 minutes away, but there's some people that are having to travel three hours to go to their federal court. And and uh, what what is your uh, quote unquote pacer akin in, in Ohio look like? Is it is it easy to use? Yeah. Is it expensive? It's pretty easy to use the, the online filing. Uh, yeah, it's a the Butler County Common Pleas has a pretty user friendly and they have a tech support guy that I like that I called. He gave me his number. So, but I learned, I, I, once you kind of clicked around, like I learned how to attach my document, I learned, so it's not that difficult. Uh, I think it's a little, it was a, I don't know, I, I want to say it's more difficult than Pacer, but that's probably just because I had already learned Pacer and I was already familiar with it, but it's not nothing, nothing to, but even for those, because there are a lot of people out in our groups that don't like to use electronic, I disagree with that personally, I think it's much easier, but that's the thing like your but your common police court might be 20 minutes down the road 10 minutes down the road whereas it's not like going to three three hour away federal court so 
there there right. are a lot of benefits yeah in my y'all opinion, too. yeah you, you're you're lucky because that's not the case here the lawyers have gotten to the the whole we have a clerk connect system and it's you have to pay twenty dollars a day to access the certain files plus two dollars a page of download oh. and uh i think i think brandon has spent uh, i mean almost seven hundred dollars filing uh against in the state court where he's the defendant uh because they filed there first so he's having to put a counterclaim in there and they're charging him to file documents to defend himself so we have some things to address here and i'm glad to hear that that's a much more kosher experience or or friendly experience in ohio than it is here yeah that's horrific that's that's paying for uh, that's that's horrible it's Uh, it's insane it's insane the thing is just yeah government has become just so expensive uh to run everything and it's just become so huge so yeah I, i'm making excuses i suppose but oh that's that's and, and there's absolutely no electronic filing in the state courts here that's yeah that's that's for a us. joke for uh, us yeah you guys are backwards down there in the bayou man no so, we're yeah just, that, like, we're I'm, just corrupt we're just trying to so pay that, the lawyers that's, you know that they're that's something to take take into consideration. Obviously, is maybe your situation isn't as easy as mine is in in Ohio. Uh, but once again, in terms of federalism and the comedy, the the relationship between the states and the United States government, like I, I read a book by the chief judge. This is what I said in my first reply brief. I kind of was going off a little bit, like. You're gonna. I'm gonna get punished here for not knowing the intricacies of the claim preclusion laws in Ohio. And I get inspired after reading a book by the chief judge of the Sixth Circuit. And now you're gonna tell me that I can't bring my action in both. Like I have rights. I have my rights under the Ohio Constitution. And my rights under the United States Constitution are just as they're equal. Just they're as valid. Separate. Yeah, they're separate and equal. So. And the defense, like the argument that the defendants were essentially making is that I was forced in order to bring all these, in order to bring all my claims, it would have forced me to take everything into the state court. And you're going to tell me that I should take my 1983 action into the state court after what the, like the whole point of 42 USC. I think it's a joke that people take 42 USC 1983 actions into the state court pretty much anyway why in the world would i do something like that when it was the states that were running roughshod over the people's rights that had to even get this federal statute so well, there, there is some some um there, there is some arguments to be made if you have a problem with a, a state official 1983 claim you would want to bring that to federal court but if you had a federal problem with like mm. a federal officer you might want to bring that 1983 into state court because they they often will will check yeah. each other so i i could see that i can that's a that's i can see that uh like emerson has said you know you take the feds to state court and you take the state to fed court so yeah that that can apply what i guess that would, would that be a bivens action the well, federal in, employee in fe- yeah in federal would be bivens right and could you have to take can you take a bivens action into uh, state I believe- court? I, be, I believe you can. I believe you can. All right. I, I don't see why not. Yeah, that makes sense. So now they, they may remove it or remand it to the federal court because of the federal claims, depending on how many state claims you have and, and that type of thing. But it's it certainly gets more eyes on it and gets everybody looking to see what's going on. Yeah. So another thing. So we have the exceptions, which I don't know if I, I posted the, the restatement of judgments in Alphonse's group, uh, I would encourage everyone to just download it and have at the ready just in case. So I know Benny is very much thinking about filing something in Florida for his Florida constitutional rights. And here's an, here's a thing that, that just makes me think like, I'm not, how dare I say something of what Alphonse should do, but my goodness gracious, like those citations that he has in his federal case, the tax case, those beautiful citations from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and those statutes, like that is just, to me, just a ripe opportunity to file in the Pennsylvania courts and let and see, just see, because maybe there are adults in Pennsylvania state courts yeah. where, where, you know, maybe. And, and I think what, what he's told me uh, in, in private is that um, Emerson 
and him have, have warned against uh, getting too many cases. And, and Brandon and I are, are examples of this, mm. of course, but you know, you spread yourself too thin and, and it's, so maybe he's yeah. waiting on that or maybe he, maybe he'll right. watch this and say, you know what, that's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, maybe, uh, cause there are very few states, there are very few states that actually like have statutes on the books similar to a 1983, you know, 42 USC 1983. But here's the counter argument to that is why should it take the general assembly of Ohio to permit me to file a lawsuit with an Ohio constitutional violation as my claim? That that puts the legislature, that puts the Ohio General Assembly above the, the the Constitution itself. So it just that that's never sat right with me. But there are a few. California is actually one of the best states when it comes to uh, state constitutional rights and the state courts upholding violations of the state constitutional right. North Carolina is another very good one. Uh, and there's a third, I believe, Virginia, Maryland. I, I one of those uh, have. I I would probably say Tennessee is probably up there too. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but it's it's such a rare thing because if you think about this, heck, uh, Monell was what 1973, 19 like it was in the 1970s. So it, it that was just when 42 USC 1983 wasn't as popular uh, as it ha- as it is now, and especially before Monell, in which you know, municipalities weren't viewed as persons. So Monell opened the floodgates to a huge degree. And now it's just, that's all anyone wants to file is just 42 USC 1983. And our state constitutions are kind of on the back back burner. But if, once I, again, remember, just... if I remember correctly, the 1983 had a, a huge swell of, of things and, and then it has dipped off. And, and right now it's starting to, to come back up again a little bit, but it's, yeah, you're right. It flattened out for a very long time. There's very few 1983 uh, suits filed for a very long time. Yeah, and it's the same thing, not to go on a different tangent, but it's the same thing with 42 USC 1985. That thing is like, no one uses it. And, and, and what the courts have done to it is they have totally neutered it with this bullshit, uh, invidious discriminatory animus element that is not that 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 should that I don't get me started on this because I could go on <laughs> and talk about this for an hour. That is a nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense, and I'll be arguing that in the Sixth Circuit. But that like there there they were created obviously after the Civil War and the Reconstruction, but states were still running roughshod. So at that time, people were bringing their bringing their claims to the state court about their their state constitutional rights. Uh, and I, I, you know, it's hard to find cases like that. Like, you know, I, I don't have archives or anything of that nature. And, but the state constitutions have just been dismissed as some, you know, secondary thing. And they're just not they're, they, they do, they deserve their time. They deserve their moment just as equally as, as our, you know, our, obviously our United States constitution is the supreme law of the land, but a really good thing in the 51 Imperfect Solutions book that it, it discussed the United States Constitution is a floor. It's a floor below which the states can't go. Th- that, that's the floor. Now, there's nothing that says that the states cannot raise that floor and that the states cannot offer more rights through their provisions of their constitutions than are provided by the United States Constitution. And that's a wonderful thing to think about is just because you know, we have gotten stymied in the federal courts with whatever, whatever right. You could take that to your state under the state mirrored constitutional right, and they might give you more freedom, more, more. That's the beautiful thing about our system is that our state courts are able to do such a thing. And our state constitutions are the supreme law of our state. So yeah. And it's our and it's our duty to, to, to search remedy wherever it is, wherever it may yes. be. Yes. Uh, and once again, I, I think that like uh, to, to say it again, anyone that has read their state constitution, I, I'm pretty sure would say, man, that is a, I know for Ohio, there are a couple of things in there that are just wonderful, uh, the, the way better than 
way more freedoms. Like, it's, I don't want to get into the details, but just almost prescient in their foresight. Like one was we in Ohio, we got it during Obamacare. And it was, I believe it's Article 1, Section 21. And it was during the Obamacare time that this amendment was added to our constitution. And you, you see that amendment in terms of what happened with COVID. And it's like, holy shit, these guys are psychics. Like they knew, like it was your right to refuse to be a part of any medical group. Like, and, and it's just, that's, where is that? That's nowhere to be found in the United States constitution, but it's right there in the Ohio constitution. So mm -hmm. that's essentially where I am with the res judicata. Uh, and there are a couple of other things just briefly to mention Serif, uh, I remember him talking in the groups about the younger abstention. And I never knew, like, what he, he talked a lot about the younger abstention. So abstentions are another area. So th these are also discretionary to some degree. But there are multiple, if you were, were to read through some of my, one of my filings where I talk about, there's the Pullman ex abstention, there's the Burford abstention and there's the big one is the colorado river abstention so it's essentially when they're difficult when they're very difficult questions of state law that are at stake the federal courts will say no this we're abstaining like we're not going to rule on this because this is a question of such significant degree of state law that the federal courts would properly not rule on it uh, so I made a couple of those arguments. Those were other reasons for why the res judicata defense just isn't going to work. So essentially, I'm confident that the judge will not. Oh, okay. So one last thing. Uh, I believe that my defense attorney really screwed up here and, and that he filed a 12B6 motion. Now he's filed a motion to add to that the defense of res judicata. And this defense of res judicata is relying upon the, 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 the Ohio claim, the Ohio Butler County Court of Common Pleas lawsuit. That is necessarily a matter outside of the pleadings. So what he has done, and he, I, I've, like in the last, in my last brief, I said, I know that I'm not like, I'm, I may be wrong. I'm just, you know, I'm just dumb per se here, but like all of these, I, I cited a multitude of Ohio appellate court and Ohio Supreme court cases that state specifically that the defense of res judicata is an affirmative defense and it does not belong in a rule 12 B motion. But this is the, this is where oftentimes they'll raise like, let's say insufficient process in a 12 B six when that's a 12 B four. And they'll raise like, like for me, like this, even though, like I said, that, that first case in Ohio was a 12 B six, that's what, that's what it was filed as they didn't have subject matter jurisdiction. So it was basically a 12 B one, but this is, this is where the, these attorneys don't, don't find the nuances within the 12 B motions. There's only a, a, a finite amount of things you can bring up in a 12 B six. And you're saying your lawyer has done the 12 B six and, and put one of these defenses in that doesn't qualify. So this is what you're absolutely, this is what you're objecting to in the, the record, right? Yeah. So if you read 12, so if we read 12 D, so the result of presenting matters outside the pleadings, if on a motion under rule 12 B six or 12 C matters outside the pleadings are presented to and not excluded by the court the motion must be treated as one for summary judgment under rule 56. so i will i'll go to all these ohio cases so let me just read it is well settled that res judicata is an affirmative defense that must be raised in a defendant's answer or be deemed waived these are there's it lists a bunch of ohio supreme court ohio appellate court decisions it is equally well, well settled that the defense of res judicata may not be raised by a motion to dismiss pursuant to rule, civil rule 12. Therefore, the trial court erred, blah, blah, blah. So they can't bring it in a rule 12. But this, what, what my lawyer is trying to do is supplement his 12b6 with this defense of res judicata based on a different court case 
which is inevitably outside the pleadings. And I'm he assuming he hasn't, he hasn't answered the complaint yet, right? No, he hasn't answered okay. yet, no. Right, so yeah, exactly. So it, 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 it's a, an affirmative defense that typically is found in an answer. So and I'm trying to tell him, like, I told him in each in each of my in my first response and in my leave to file a sir reply i'm like i'm not i'm i'm, I'm telling him and he said he's insinuating that i'm telling the court that, they, that that he can't do this that he can't supplement his motion to dismiss with the defense of reggie jacotta i'm right. saying nobody I, you can do it you can do it I, I, of course you can there have been other cases that show you can but what your motion is right now, you have a pending 12B6. So unless you're filing, and I said this, I said unless you're filing, filing a separate 12B1, which is subject matter jurisdiction, which is typically where a res judicata would fall, which he, and he just, he just keeps like ignoring it. So here's another one. In resolving a civil, in resolving a civ rule 12B6 motion, a court is confined to the averments set forth in the complaint. This is an Ohio Supreme Court case. The affirmative defense of res judicata is not properly raised in a Rule 12b6 motion because it requires reference to materials outside the complaint, i.e. the previous action upon which the defense is based, and therefore is a matter which should be raised on summary judgment. So, if so, as we still as we stand now, and this guy's insistence and his, I, I don't want to call him stupid, but like, I, this is clearly what you're what you're doing. This is what the courts say. Why are you? He doesn't. I don't think he wants to go to a summary judgment. But if this court, I think the the, the federal court is now there. They have to do it if they consider this evidence. If they consider this defense at all. Then it has to automatically trigger that conversion from the 12b6 to the rule 56. So I'll have a summary judgment, which is great. Uh, thank you. I don't even I don't need discovery at all in this case. Like the facts are the facts, pretty cut and dry, cut and dry. They cut my grass. So that's where we are. Uh, so this guy just like it's clearly outside the pleadings, but he just he didn't get it. So I'm confident. Uh, it, it's been a roller coaster very much a roller coaster of like feeling like an idiot and then feeling better. And then I like, he'll file something else. And I'll kind of be like, well, then you feel like an idiot again, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure that I'm, that res judicata will not be used uh, to dismiss the complaint. And also I know a hell of a lot more about res judicata than I did two months ago. So win, win. Yeah. If nothing else, so does everyone watching. And so, uh, you know, and maybe, maybe, maybe as your uh, analogy goes, that maybe more people will be shooting the second free throw now. I hope think. so. I think we should. And, and it, if anything else, we should all be purchasing uh, Chief Judge Sutton's book, 51 Imperfect Solutions on Amazon. Uh, I'd love to see him get some more book sales. And, and it, I can, it is something for our law libraries that I, and the thing about, so just in terms of the book, uh, four, it, it goes into four situations in which the states changed federal law and the way that the federal courts interpreted certain, one, one of them being school choice, school vouchers, uh, that was one of the subject matter. The, the one, it was in the 1950s, I think Brandon and you guys might have actually discussed this in the Shelley Dick. It was the Latter-day Saints uh, kids that like the Pledge of Allegiance where they, they were, there was a, like a lot of cases around the country in which they didn't want to do the Pledge of Allegiance. They, they felt it was against their religious beliefs. That was one of them. Uh, a third was the horrific situations in the 1920s uh, around like Buck versus Bell, which is a forced sterilization in the federal courts, the Supreme Court, what a horrific, like, that's like their black, one of their black eyes. You know, you got Dred Scott, the, the, the black eyes of the Supreme Court are Dred Scott, uh, Buck v. Bell and Korematsu. Uh, Korematsu was the internment camps of the Japanese. You could make the argument that, you know, uh, Roe versus Wade was a horrific and the Chevron decision. deference, but we've since corrected that. Right. Which, <laughs> Hey, did you know that it was Scalia that was kind of behind the monster that was created? 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he talked about it, and, and uh, I think he, he regretted it, and basically, in, in conference with, uh, with, with, with Thomas, you know, said, well, that's just water, water under the dam. There's, there's nothing to do about it now. And, and here we are. Thomas is, is here correcting, correcting hmm. the issue. Yeah, I didn't know it was us. Uh, I didn't know it was Scalia that kind of was. He was trying to do something good, and and turned into he, he created a monster. So on that subject, it, there's an interesting discussion to be had during the time in which the administrative state was growing and was being created. There were certain judges like that had huge influence. Uh, Judge Henry Friendly was one of them. And Friendly, actually, he's like, the, a lot of people consider him the godfather of administrative law. He wrote, uh, anyway, Henry Friendly advocated that there should be separate administrative courts, uh, that the federal court should have administrative, like, like he thought about maybe we should create, maybe we should have legislation that creates administrative courts. But no, they didn't. And that's why these courts, that's why we're, I think that's, a big reason why we're getting so bogged down is because it's like you know t the, the delta against the federal aviation committee or what like we have all these administrative law cases that fed article three judges are having to rule on and it's like send them off to some other administrative court but it was decided that they didn't want to do that and i think that perhaps it's a bad decision but anyway we should all buy that book. Uh, and, and I think so, it's good reading. So what are the upcoming dates that you're looking for? Is there any specific date or something that we're looking for a resolution to any of these matters or we just don't know? Any day now. Any day. You know, it, it could be two weeks, could be six months. Uh, it's already <laughs> been, it's already been many months. You know, it's already been since March that it's been fully briefed. And now we've got this res judicata monkey wrench that was just thrown in there. So he's got a lot. It's he's got. And has, has he set a has he set a, a a date for the hearing in state court or are have you? Or? Oh no, the state court's done. Okay, state court's over. Okay, state court's over. I'm not appealing it. I'm done with that. Gotcha. Uh, so right now it's Judge McFarland. He's that okay. federal judge that I have a lot of faith. I, I have a good feeling about. He's the one that made the uh, the injunctive relief ruling for the Air Force servicemen when it came to Air Force servicemen and women when it came to the uh, vax mandate. So okay. he's not afraid to speak truth to power. I've read a couple of his opinions. He's a he's a good one. So it it could be any time now, and it's just we'll see though because what I what I think might happen is that he might just say I grant you know defendants res judicata like addition to their motion which therefore triggers the rule 56 summary judgment and you know let's say maybe each that's a possibility that he, he, he then says each side has 30 days with which to present their motion for summary judgment and at that point i don't know i've never done one uh i, I know you have a while ago and i'm sure i could figure it i'm i will figure it out but I kind of just, is there any, in your opinion, would it be stupid of me to just say, I, I rest on everything that I've presented so far, or do I, do I have to present a motion for summary judgment? Um, well, I guess it depends on what his ruling is, but so what, well, what Alphonse and, and we have done because they're delaying this 12 B six motion so long that they presented no evidence, no facts on the record, um, at all. And that's required to, have a 12B6 motion successful. And so what we've done is said, okay, well, since there's no dispute of any material facts, if you're not gonna put anything on the record, we've done we've mm. done it in and we we've done it in um in our Mississippi case too. And put the uh summary judgment in and say, okay, well great. If you don't want to put anything on the record, then we want we want a motion on the pleadings. We want a decision on the a judgment on the pleadings which a 12B6 could be if it's filed after a, um, a response to pleading is, is done, like an answer, then it would, yeah. be, it would be converted to a judgment on the pleadings anyway. So we're saying, well, if you don't want to put anything on the record, there's no dispute of facts, so make, it, make, make a judgment. And so that's what we've done. So, but yeah, um, I, I think it's a, a safer thing uh, for you to do. And it's, it's really not difficult. It's basically 
you know, a, 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 a lot of repeat of your complaint, but, mm -hmm. um, and, and any other facts you've gathered between then and now, but if there's, if they have put any facts on the record, then what, what is there to, to judge on other than, you know, he'll just regurgitate lawyers, lawyers words right. of hearsay. Yeah. He'll just regurgitate everything that he has filed for his 12 B six, which is nonsense. Uh, but so that's just, that's where I think that I could envision this happening. And technically, frankly, if I were the judge, this is what he, this is what you're supposed to do. He, he should be converting the motion to dismiss because of the res judicata out being matters outside the pleadings. It should convert to a rule 56 and then he should give the parties, you know, like I said, 30 days, however many days to file their motion for summary judgment. And I would assume that we would just file like each side would file. I'd file a motion for summary judgment and then they would too. I don't know if we would respond to them. I don't want, I want to get this fucking thing done. And I know that that's how we all feel to a large degree, but it's just like, I don't want anyway, I'll deal with whatever I got to deal with. And so then I've got the, uh, the sixth circuit mass gathering, uh, appeal. So I don't know. He, the defense counsel Wagner has requested oral argument. I've agreed to it. I said, fine, if you want, let's, let's have oral argument. If you want, I said, I'd like to have it streamed. Uh, cause I guess it is live, which is cool. The sixth circuit does do live streaming of oral arguments. Mm -hmm. But as of right now, I've been in limbo for three months awaiting a, a panel of judges. It seems like a long time. How long ago did you file the appeal? The appeal was filed. The notice of appeal was filed in November. Okay. And then uh, have you, have you submitted your brief? Oh, the briefs are, we've been fully briefed for three months. And yep. you've done your sir reply? Yep. Okay, so we're, so, yep. yeah. Well, so the, if you go on the court's website, it usually tells you how long it takes them to adjudicate a case. The Fifth Circuit is about nine months. It takes about nine months, unfortunately. Fully. Yeah. Yeah, well, well I'd heard, I, I, it did, I found an average, I don't recall, I want to say it was like eight to 12 months. So, you know, show, once again, here we are in July now, but I'm just saying it just has taken a long time for them to even give me a panel. It's been, there's, they do like little acronyms and it's, mine has been A-W-S-U-B, so awaiting submission to a panel for over three months. And I'm just, I can't wait for like to see what three judges I get. You know, I, I know like the Sixth Circuit roster, like a, like a baseball team, you know, I'm hoping for certain ones. Uh, so I'm, uh, it's, I'm anticipating who i get i hate to give you uh uh bad news here but it says um this is from the sixth circuit appellate blog it says if you have a complex commercial personal injury or constitutional appeal our experience in the sixth circuit is that the time for the appeal will often be about 16 or 17 months that account oh. that accounts for ordering transcripts extensions briefs oral arguments and wait for a decision all right. Well, so they're, they're Jeez, but Louise. in in Brett's case in the Fifth Circuit, he appealed. I mean, they got back to him in you know I think five or six months. I'm I I had filed my 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 city of Central case, and it it took eleven months uh, when it when the average is nine, and Brett got his in six. Mm -hmm. So you just don't know. You just don't know. Yeah. But, but th thank you for coming on and telling us uh, and show showing us uh, the second bite of the apple uh, and about res judicata. And with that being said, I'm going to give you the last word. Thank you, Tate. You're welcome. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, as we're growing with this, it's just super cool to face different, uh, different legal arguments in different situations. And once again, I thank you. And I would just... To, hey, hey I'm, it's like I'm a book salesman. I would just encourage everyone to go out and get 51 Imperfect Solutions, and I'd love to love to talk about it with anyone that does read it. So thanks again, Gary. That's great, Kenny. You're welcome here anytime, Tate. Have a great one.